Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, 300,000 cars a day on the American Legion Bridge, and yet the Montgomery County Council again votes against a second Potomac River bridge crossing. Governor Larry Hogan opposes offshore drilling, opposed fracking in Western Maryland, opposes the Mid-Atlantic Pipeline. Will someone tell Governor Hogan that running as a liberal Republican will get him unelected? The Russian connection gets murkier than ever, and have we lost faith in our national institutions? Stay tuned. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by the Dean of Democratic Politics, Sam Statlin. Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Unkefer. Republican activist, Phil Bell. And political strategist, Richard Parsons. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Since the early 1950s, transportation planners have recommended that a second Potomac River bridge connecting Montgomery County and Northern Virginia be built. And just as surely the leading politicians in Montgomery County on the Montgomery County Council voiced their opposition to even thinking about a second Potomac River crossing. Montgomery County Council President Roger Berliner said Monday that the project would seriously damage the county's 90,000 acre agricultural reserve Maryland's transportation dollars, he added, would be better spent widening Interstate 270 and the Legion Bridge. He was quoted as saying, we need to fix what is broken, not fantasize about a bridge that will never happen. And he said this at his weekly news conference. Sam, 300,000 cars a day make the trip across the American Legion Bridge. Isn't it time to recognize that there is a critical mass overusing our limited highways and build a second crossing? Casey, for years, those of us who have been attuned to the massive problems we have with traffic here in Montgomery County have supported a second crossing. We've supported a second crossing from Point of Rocks down through Montgomery County, extending uh, 370 across and not touching the Agricultural Reserve. And I think what's going on with the politicians is they're more interested in getting elected and saying things that they think is populist that people don't want to touch the preserve, which is worthwhile, but they're not doing things in the best interest of the citizens of Montgomery County. They're choking off the economic development in Montgomery County. They are so short-sighted, I can't stand it. Mark, on July 8th, the recreational vehicle caught fire just past the River Road exit on the Beltway, stopping traffic in both directions for more than six hours. Now, if there is a national emergency, even without any incidents on the Beltway, congestion would be at standstill. This is a t situation that's intolerable. Why won't the council even address it? Well, it's simple, Potomac. You think of the trouble that the Purple Line having, had going through one country club, Columbia Country Club's land. Think about the problems you'd have going through the Potomac area. It's, it's not, not the, going through Potomac. It's, not, it's going through Poolsville. It's going no, through Dorstown. No, it's No, it's even not further a, north than no, that. No, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Listen, there's no, it's much close. It's going through Potomac, Casey. And there's strips of public yeah. land. For it's it not to going go that far. On. Yeah, that is there. Well, you can correct me on that in a second. Yeah. Phil, is the problem <clears throat> political that the constituency that affects the county council is down south in Tacoma Park and Silver Spring? It's time for a new county council. I agree, it is time for new county council. That's always something that has to be dealt with when we're talking about Montgomery County. But a lot of this is the same sort of politics you see everywhere when it comes to transportation. Hey, I wanna get around, but not here, not in my backyard. So this is one of the situations where if we actually had leaders here and also in Fairfax County on the other side to say, look, you know what? What matters most is making sure that we don't have traffic jams like that. I was stuck in it and there's no way that's acceptable uh, for anybody. You told me you had to go all the way around the other side of the Beltway to get to Rockville. Exactly. I drove all the way around and up to 200 and down just to get to Rockville, which should have been And that's no picnic trip. either. Rich, there's bad. This story reminds me of the ICC days. Yes. When th there was a growing frustration with all of the politicians who again refused to even consider the ICC. 
is it time we're going to reach a critical mass and throw these guys out of office? Well, just like it, it's eerily familiar reading the quote from Roger Berliner that the bridge is never going to happen. If I had a nickel for every person 15, 20 years ago who would tell me, Rich, why are you wasting your time on the ICC? It's never going to happen. If I, I would be retired already. Okay, These things happen because they have to happen and there's not a better alternative. There's going to be an effort coming out of the region to study a second bridge crossing. It will look at all the alternatives. It will decide whether should it be in Poolsville, should it be in Potomac. All those, all those questions can be answered if we have the study, looking at the facts, looking at the alternatives. We've looked at transit alternatives before. None of them work. We've looked at just widening the American Legion Bridge, which gets you a few years, but it doesn't solve the problem. What the study is going to show is the pros and cons of each option. Then we can make an informed decision. But what Berliner and his cronies are doing, I think that's really flying in the face of public opinion right now, is they're not even looking to study the issue. They, they are trying to kill a study of the issue. They're it's not that they're against the bridge. Oh, they don't even want to study the facts. Mark, mark real quick. The it's problem crazy. gets worse because the jobs are in Virginia and people in Maryland have to commute to Virginia. And that's part of the issue of why there are 300,000 going across the bridge But they're every going day. the other way, too. And 40% well, yes, of the jobs in Montgomery County are filled by people who live in places like Prince George's, Frederick is, Inn, Northern Virginia. There's reverse said, commuting, too. As McAuliffe said, I don't care. The bridge is going to be in Maryland, which means he doesn't want to put no, any money up true. to the bridge. That was a misquote of what he said. He's very much in favor of a second bridge crossing. He's made it, Terry McAuliffe has made no secret he wants a second bridge crossing between Montgomery County and Northern Virginia. Are they willing but to put Phil, money up? Phil, Rich, let, they'll, let me they'll ask put question. money up to build up, they, they, he's correct in that they're not legally responsible for the, for the river that's <laughs> correct. owned by Maryland. I want to go to Phil real quick. Why do we need to spend so much time with the study? A lot of the road planners earlier were very prescient in what needed to be done a long time ago. Their plans that already exist, right. whether it's part of the uh, George Washington <coughs> Parkway or otherwise, that could be done. We should because be talking about it's it's doing required it by law. You you can't do a you can't build a project without. Law. Well, it's the Shouldn't Environmental it's Policy Act. It's, advocate here. It's not Let's make change. it this is federal these. law. We're, yeah. yeah, but we're talking about but, national security. We're talking about commerce. Right. We're talking about jobs. We're even talking Phil, about for the greenies out there, the environment. Well, listen, let's change that. Listen, I know you're a Trump guy, but you do need to study issues and actually know the facts before you take a position. And I think it's appropriate to study this issue for now and see what the study says on a specific alignment. What are the pros? What are the costs? What are the benefits for congestion? And then we can have an informed debate. What the council's doing is flatly irresponsible. And they're going to find out what we found out with the ICC fight. When the council gets so far out of touch with the voters, people lose their seats. And that's what's going to start happening again. You get s almost 70% of Montgomery County voters support a bridge crossing. Uh, that includes primary Democrats. That includes I want to, I want to Republicans, wrap this up. everybody. I want to wrap this up by going to yeah. the panel. Will this be a hot topic in the 2018 election? We'll start with Mark. Yes. Sam. No. Rich. Yes. Phil. Absolutely. I think absolutely it will be a topic. Already you can see uh, Robin Ficker is pounding this issue in his tweets and in his, and his releases. This is going to be a big time issue. Economic growth is going to be very important when, as we, we transition to 2018. All right, let's talk about the next race that's coming up, and that's for governor. Governor Larry Hogan's election in 2014 was attributable to a platform that called for reducing taxes, reducing government spending and regulation, and promoting economic growth. Hogan adroitly rode a wave of dissatisfaction that existed in western Maryland and the eastern shore to victory. Now there are questions about how he will position himself in his run for re-election. Sam, will the same platform that got Hogan elected in 14 be successful in 2018? I think any politician that runs on a four-year-old platform is making a big mistake. I think Hogan is smart enough to look at current situations, look where he can get his vote base from, and plot along in that direction, and he still, his popularity is extremely high. It's not going to be an easy thing to, de to um, defeat him, but I think he's got the upper ridge. Why do you say it won't be easy when you have, when you have a two-to-one uh, voter registration uh, majority in the state. Because there's a lot of, he has a lot of popularity amongst Democratic voters who think he's doing a good job. And, and, and in basically, he is keeping his promises. But will they vote for a Republican? 
Well, they might a general election, but obviously not in the primary. All right, Mark, the, the angry rural voter came out strong in support of Governor Hogan in 2014, but since then he's shifted some of his positions. He opposed offshore drilling, he opposed fracking in Western Maryland, and he opposed the Mid-Atlantic gas pipeline. Will someone tell Governor Hogan that running as a liberal Republican is going to get him unelected? I don't know that as a liberal Republican. Part of the strength or some of the character of, of Larry Hogan is to be very focused on a very few specific things and to put other issues to the side. And this is spending an economy. The government has, the, he, that's what he's wanted to focus on. And uh, other issues he's put off and in where he's not going to win a battle. He would not have won a, a battle in the legislature on fracking. And so that wasn't a battle he was prepared to fight. But, but let's look where the votes are, are Mark. I mean, the, reali the reality is he needs hit that base in Western Maryland and in the Eastern Shore to come out extremely strong in support of him because you know Montgomery County sure. and you know Prince George's County is going to come out very strong in support of a Democrat because right. they want to take the, the governor's mansion back. And I would expect Democratic turnout to be much higher this year than previous elections because Donald Trump has really energized the Democrats who sat out and, and allowed him to be elected. Uh, so I think you're going to see uh, Hogan continue to strategically move to the left, if you will, or at least to the center. I wouldn't call it left, but at least to the center right from the far right, because I think that's the only strategy he has for political survival. There's several Democrats who could take him on, I think, uh, pretty convincingly, uh, Phil, given the dynamics. I mean, you're, you are a conservative, conservative activist. Right. Is, is Larry Hogan maintaining his base, or is he in jeopardy of losing his base by some of the positions he's taking? I don't think he's yet in jeopardy of losing it because there hasn't been anything that is just overt, hey, wait a second, you should have done this, uh, that he's an action that he's taken. Now, I agree with you, though, on the pipeline and the fracking and the other issues. These are things he should have gone the other way for because not only is it good electoral politics to maintain the base, but also has the ability to build that important legacy, which is to get Maryland off of the government dole, which is where it is now in terms of the economic uh, growth engine and to make it so that a lot of folks in the rural areas have the opportunity to grow and have long-term economic success. Uh, I got to disagree with you, Rich, here. Uh, I would not say in any way that President Trump was elected because Democrats sat out, and I don't think that he is going to energize them against Larry Hogan in 2013, a work for Chris Christie, and you had, just as you had energized Democrats, you had those same energized Democrats supporting a popular governor, which they did overwhelmingly then, and I think that's what's going to happen now. So I think in this upcoming election, the, the one route that is going to help people get elected are those people who are not incumbents. New fresh thoughts, new yep. fresh people coming in are but going to have an upper leg because the electorate is so dissatisfied. But the current but the, elected but the, but officials. Really but if true. you look at the at the at the at the candidates that have announced for, in the Democratic Party, they're all, one form or, or another, political retreads. You've got you got the county executive of Prince George's County. You got Ben Jealous running. You got everybody. None of those people are fresh. Ben Jealous has never been elected who's, to who's office. Who's fresh? And I think Ben Jealous at this point in time might have the upper edge. Really? Yes. When he has no political base whatsoever. His base isn't too bad in Baltimore I don't City. Think we know, with with the I don't think we know. Do you with I don't think we know what the playing field is going to look like yet. I think there's still some key players. John Delaney hasn't decided. There's some key players still deciding whether to get in or out. I think in a few months we'll have a much clearer picture than we have today. I, I don't think you see the the Democratic field yet. But and I think Baker should not be underestimated. I, I think one of the reasons that so many of the Democrats, like John Delaney, haven't gotten into this race is, frankly, their polling number doesn't is not all that encouraging against for them against Hogan, and that's why there's so many second-tier candidates. Well, how that does are, this compare compare when when Ehrlich was running for re-election? Ehrlich was a very popular, quote unquote, popular governor, well, but he didn't have the support. See, I'll let you wrap what, it up. What happened with Ehrlich? He ran as a moderate Republican, got himself elected, and then governed from the hard right and lost all of his moderate independent support. You know, That's his, why he lost. The Republicans would say that he right. from the hard right. Hogan's not making that mistake. Republicans would say that he governed from the hard right. Yeah. When we come back from this short break, the Russian connection gets murkier than ever, and have we lost faith in our national institutions? Stay tuned.
And welcome back. Earlier in the week, the ongoing Russian collusion case seemed to take on new urgency with reports that President Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., had agreed to meet with a Russian lawyer for the purpose of getting political opposition information about Hillary Clinton. Soon thereafter, the story took a further detour when it was learned that Russian attorney Natalia Valenskaya may have gotten favorable treatment from the Obama administration in getting a visa into the United States, and further that the company she worked for, Prezavzan Holdings, hired her to secure a repeal of the Majinsky Act, which allowed Justice Department to seize American assets of corrupt Russian businesses. Prevazan also supported a group called Fusion GPS, which hired British spy Christopher Steele to compile a dossier on presidential candidate Donald Trump. Does your head hurt yet because of all, the, all these, these machinations? Phil, is there any there there to this Russian collusion story? Boy, this is so much fun. First of all, there is no there there. I worked for a presidential campaign once, and I got a call like this. Somebody had information on, a, on the front runner in the primary that we were running in, so I listened, took very good notes, and uh, went out to verify if it's true. If somebody has information, or says they have information on your opponent, you listen, and if they ha give you something, you verify it. It's called politics. Now, I also read an article in The Hill that described this whole affair in great boring detail. Turns out this lawyer and her friends went around and did something very crazy. They lobbied members of Congress. They asked them for something, and they talked about issues. What a crazy thing to happen in the United States. Rich, is it possible that the Russians intended all along to play both political parties off against one another to undermine American trust in the democratic process? And haven't they succeeded? Well, yes, they've succeeded, but it, it, it is unfathomable for anyone fair-mindedly looking at the facts here to conclude anything other than the, the, the conclusion that the Russians did successfully meddle with this election to benefit Donald Trump. And as we know now this week from the revelations from uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s emails, there is documented evidence of collusion between uh, the Russian government which when no. you get a call from the Russian government, maybe a little bit of patriotism ought to wake up in your conscience somewhere, and you ought to think of your country first rather than colluding well, was, with a foreign was, was, power was, was, who has was, nothing was but a call from nothing the but government? ill intent That's towards our the country. That's the question, Mark. Yes, there was fair, a call from the Russian government. There was a individual. Do you agree with with <coughs> Rich's statement? There's we, collusion all over the place. We here. have whether well, first of all, it wasn't the Russian government; it was some people operating and if on you their own that, who were also. Who were about. also, as as Casey pointed out, working with this uh, GPS uh, Fusion GPS, the the lawyers that let them into the country came from the office of the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District, for which Robert Mueller has wholesale hired into the Special Prosecutor's Office. So we have like two degrees of separation that are kind of making this whole thing so much more confusing. Mark, it's naive it's not to think that those two people somewhere along the line were not greatly influenced by the Russian government. We, 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 know, we know the email yeah. hack was committed by actors Correct. of the Russian government. We know they were given to WikiLeaks, which released only the Democratic files that they had to damage Hillary Clinton at the request of the Russian government. This is known, wait, and wait, anyone wait, who wait. hides hold, behind hold semantics on, here let's, is being a coward. We know ourselves. what happened here. The Russians meddled. They got away with it. They had an impact. And yes, it has undermined our institutions, going back to Casey's Chris, question. I think it's undermined them the seriously. Question. Serious question. It sounds to me like you and the rest of the Democrat Party are upset because the American people found out exactly who your candidate was, didn't like her, and voted against her. No, they but found out false information, and a lot of it which was oh, illegally obtained. A lot, you know, some of those emails funny, from Podesta's no, account were the, hacked. He was and, the victim of a phishing uh, attack that he agreed to. No. He signed well, into a phishing attack, you which know, I'm sorry is which something is illegal. you should have been smart you know, enough this, to not this, do. This conversation points out the disconnect that the American people feel right. amongst ele elected officials and members of the press in talking about stuff that they really don't even care about. And when it comes to election time, do you think that this is going to mean anything six Sam, years from now? But Sam, I think people Where do care report? about colluding with a foreign power that does have a, an interest should, in undermining the strength of this I, country where, and undermining our democratic However, system. Where's the even it's right there in the email the chain. I, I, I can't see it. What well, is well, somebody you you says, say you worked in a presidential campaign? I did. Things, so did I, Phil. I don't say I did it. How yeah, often? How often do you have a meeting between the the campaign chairman and two senior officials who are both? relatives of Donald Trump 
how do you trivialize a meeting like that? When you have the campaign chairman in a meeting, it's not a small thing that wasn't signed off on by the senior leadership of the campaign, including the candidate. Right. You don't I'm, have that kind of a meeting if, I'm, you know, if it's I'm not, running, if it's I'm not running, fully I wanna, bought I wanna, in. I want to get in here as, as a referee. Yeah. Because, because once again, and this, is, this has been indicative for the last 18 months of the division, and Sam is absolutely correct. We have a tremendous division. Rich, I hate to tell you this, not everybody agrees with you. I understand and Not that. every rational person agrees with you. And I don't know whether, whether there's collusion or not. Some rational but people get in I denial. Don't, I, don't think, I don't think it's been proven yet. And, but we are going to go through more months and months and maybe even another year of, of this drama. And in the meantime, the American economy and the American people and the American businesses are not getting anything done. Jamie, Jamie Dimon, Trump's the head of J.P. Morgan done. today, in a conference call, exploded in frustration over the lack of ability of our Congress to do anything. And, and, it's and this, hurt, is, this, this is a this consequence of drip, electing drip, the guy we chose to elect. By the Democratic Party no, is this hurting is, the American people. You're, you're blaming Stay the victim here. Stay tuned for parting shots. And welcome back. Now, many of you know that I am very much uh, worried about the gang crime situation here in Montgomery County. And for those of you ha who have an interest, the County Council is actually going to have a subcommittee hearing this coming Monday with the Chief of Police to talk about the gang issue. It's at 10 o'clock in the morning. So anybody who's working probably won't be able to go to it but if you want to see it, it will be videoed, and you can follow. You can follow along. The gang crime problem is a serious issue in Montgomery County, and up till now, our politicians haven't been addressing it seriously enough. Sam Statlin, your parting shot. My parting shot goes to Mr. Bush. I'm glad you're back, Mr. Bush, and I'm glad your surgery and your liver replacement went well. But you deserve a really big, big boo for the way you treated Sheila Hickson at the beginning of the session. If you had decided you didn't want her as a chair, you should have made that decision before the start of the session, instead of putting her through a big embarrassment that she doesn't deserve. So I'm gonna give Sheila Hickson a big shout out for serving the people of Montgomery County so very, very well, and the Democratic Party locally and on a national level. Thank you, Sam. Mark Gunkifer, your parting shot. Well, we're coming to an end of an era in Bethesda as the Barnes & Noble will be closing at the end of this year after I, I, it seems longer, but it's been a 20-year run uh, in downtown Bethesda. It certainly changed that whole particular area. So if there was an era in Bethesda of the Hot Shops era, now we're coming to the end of the Barnes & Noble era. We'll see what happens next. Thank you. Phil, your party shot. My parting shot goes out to the new Amtrak Chief Executive Officer, Richard Anderson, who just came over from Delta Airlines. He successfully led at Northwest, successfully led at Delta. Now he's taken on a new challenge, apparently for zero dollars. So that shows he really is committed to doing what it takes to change industry and hopefully making Amtrak not great again, but making it great because it's never been very good. Well, thank you, Phil. Rich Parsons, your parting shot. <laughs> well, I'm gonna circle back to the, it, it, a topic slightly related to the bridge issue, but a broader theme. You know, the region did a study several years back that found our regional long-range plans come about 72% short in terms of capacity that we need to keep congestion from getting a lot worse. And that's the broader context in which we had that discussion earlier in the show about not even studying things like a bridge crossing. I hope the council reconsiders and at least, I don't care whether they're for a bridge or against the bridge at this point, let's at least get the facts. Thank you, Rich. Now, as, uh, as, we, as we have two more shows left before we take our, our August break, you know we're French and we break for August each year, I'm, I'm very happy that the Nationals are coming back after the All-Star game. And Phil is going to be very disappointed the rest of the year because his Mets are not doing so well. But the Nats, they need to find some relief pitching. And hopefully there will be a magic deal pulled off before the trading deadline and we can find a, pi a pitcher that can get somebody out in the ninth inning. So for, K for 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken. I want to thank the panel for being here tonight on a very muggy and hot July evening. How about this?